Hello, today is April 13th, 2022. My name is Jorge Hernandez. I'm interviewing Marlene Calderon for the University Library Special Collections and Archives at the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley, hereafter abbreviated as UTRGV. This project is in partnership with the Voces Oral History Center at the University of Texas at Austin. Please know, uh, Ms. Calderon, that this interview will be placed in the University Library Special Collections and Archives at UTRGV and share with the Voces Oral History Center at the University of Texas at Austin. If there is anything you do not wish to answer or talk about, I will honor your wishes. Also, if there is something you want to talk about, please bring it up and we'll talk about it. The University Library Special Collections and Archives will archive your interview along with any other photographs and other documentation you are willing to share. UTRGV University Library will retain copyright or non-exclusive right to the interview and any other materials you donate to special collections and archives at UTRGV. Because we are not conducting this interview in person, I need to record you consent consenting to make sure you agree with our interview procedures before we continue. So I'll ask you in a series of six questions. Please say, yes, I agree, or no, I do not agree after each question. Do you give the University Library Special Collections and Archives at UTRGV consent to archive your interview and your material at the UTRGV University Library? Yes, I agree. Do you grant the UTRGV University Library Special Collections and Archives right, title, and interest in copyright over the interview and any materials you provide? Yes, I agree. Do you agree to allow UTRGV University Library Special Collections and Archives to post this interview on the internet where it may be viewed by people around the world? Yes, I agree. Do you grant the University Library Special Collections and Archives consent to share your Zoom interview with the Voces Oral History Center at the University of Texas at Austin for inclusion in the Voices of the of a Pandemic Oral History mini project? which will include posting the interview on the internet. Yes, I agree. As you recall, we previous, previously filled out a print interview from, form. We use information from the pre-interview form to help in research. The entire form is kept in a secure Voices server at the University of Texas at Austin. Before Voices sends it to UTRGV University Library Special Collections and Archives, we would have stripped out any contact information for yourself or family members. So that will not be part of your public file. Your public file will only be accessible at UTRGV University Library. The final two questions that I have to ask for consent are on, on what you, I'm sorry. The final two questions ask for your consent on what I just described. Do you wish for us to share the rest of your interview in your public file available to researchers at UTRGV University Library Special Collections and Archives. Yes, I agree. On occasion, UTRGV Special Collections and Archives and Voices receive requests from journalists who wish to contact our interview subjects. We only deal with legitimate news outlets. Do you give, do you give consent for us to share your phone number or your email with journalists? Yes. Thank you for your consent. Your experiences and stories mean a lot to us at UTRGV Special Collections and Archives. I look forward to what you have to say in the interview questions I will now ask. Okay, Marlene, thank you for your time. Like I said earlier, your stories and experiences are valuable to us at UTRGV Special Collections and Archives and to our partners at the Voces Oral History Center at the University of Texas at Austin. Because you are the Palm View Community Center Recreation Supervisor, work with the city of McKellen and are a strong family-oriented individual. I know you have many meaningful stories and experiences to share on how COVID-19 has impacted these roles you carry out in your life. So before we talk about COVID-19 stories, can you please share with us a bit about yourself, who you are, and how you wish to be known? Who is Marlene Calderon? 
Well, my name is, my full name is Marlene Yvette Calderon. I am born and raised uh, from the Rio Grande Valley. I'm actually from a small town, Donna. I graduated from Donna High School. Um, I was very fortunate to go off to college, so I attended the University of Texas at San Antonio, where I received my Bachelor's of Science in Kinesiology with a concentration in exercise science. I then uh, obtained my master's degree from Texas Women's University. So I have my master's of science in kinesiology with an emphasis in sports management. Um, that's pretty much a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm very proud to be from South Texas. And on my spare time, I like to spend time with my family and go hunting and just listen to the Hano music, basically. Okay, thank you very much for that quick introduction about yourself. So in this first section of questions, I ask you to please share your stories and memories from when the COVID-19 pandemic made its first impacts in December, 2019 to about the summer of 2020. So my first question is, can you share some memorable stories about how you first heard or learned about COVID-19? I feel like when I first heard about COVID, it was honestly kind of like a blur. I was very, it was very confusing for me. Um, I, I mean, I was working with, I'm working with the city of McAllen and we're so used to having a variety of programs and a lot of individuals coming in and out of our facilities. So to go from that to hearing about this virus that was permanently harming individuals, um, it was kind of all just really surreal and crazy. And it was just all kind of coming at all of us at once. Um, so it was really kind of confusing for me um, and it was just a really crazy time. So I just remember being at work and having like my mom and my dad call me telling me what's going on. I'm not one to really watch the news. So I was kind of late in the game with trying to understand fully what was going on around the world. Um, so yeah, that's really what I re recall from when I was first hearing about COVID. I think something I re distinctively remember was that all the sports were being canceled, like games were being canceled. So I remember I had tickets to a Spurs game and then I went from having tickets to not being able to go because of COVID. That's kind of what I remember um, when I was first hearing about the pandemic. So as far as like the news go or anything like that, you mainly just got it from, from work and then from uh, like any events you were gonna attend. Yeah, and social media. Um, social media played a big factor also in me being made aware of what was going on with the pandemic or what with this new virus that was coming into um, our surrounding areas. And so you also mentioned that you work with the city of McAllen. Were there any maybe like early reports or rumors that you had heard around the city um, pertaining about COVID-19 that you remember back in 2020? Like rumors? Yes, maybe anything like indicating of what it might be um, inside, like for the city of McKenna, like what was gonna happen um, or anything like that? Yes, so there was a lot of controversy when COVID first was hitting. It was the city was kind of looking, okay, like what are other cities in the Valley? How are they tackling this on oncoming virus? Um, but it was also, there was rumors with them talking like, well, we need to wait to see what the governor was gonna do. So it was kind of, this, I feel like the city, we were all just playing like a waiting game, but that was a lot of, I mean, there was a lot of talk going on um, amongst the whole entire department within Parks and Recreation alone. So it was just kind of seeing what other cities were doing and seeing what our upper management was going to decide um, to move forward with, with protocols and stuff like that. And so at that time, because we worked together, you were at Lark Community Center, right? Yes. Were there, were there like many things happening at the center at the time when, uh, when these like rumors were going around or when everybody was kind of waiting to see what was going to happen? Yeah, we had, I think we were in our, since it was in March, I believe, it was in our spring session. Um, so we had a variety of programs that were going on at the Lark Community Center, which involved um, kids from ages two to about 10, 11 years old, as well as our senior citizens. Um, so we had a variety of things that were going on throughout our facility, which of course included our staff, which majority of our staff were young 
high school or college student. Um, so that was something that was going on at our facility that we were really truly concerned about what was gonna happen with our programs as well as with our staff um, because of COVID coming, coming at us so strongly. And so at what point did you realize this pandemic was a serious life altering event? I feel like it took me a while to realize how, in all honesty, to realize like how serious this virus was. I think at first I was kind of just not, not that I wasn't taking it seriously, but I wasn't taking it, taking it as seriously as a lot of other people were. So I think the moment I thought that, okay, wow, this is like something really serious that's going on was when I was already, I believe I was already transferred to Palmview and there was a number of staff from our parks department as well as the recreation department that were all out at once. Um, my facility alone was left with two full-time staff, which included myself and one part-time staff. And we're a staff of about 10. So hearing those numbers and seeing how many parks individuals who their team is made up of about a hundred and half of them are out due to COVID. Um, I think that it was that in that moment when I really did realize that this was something really serious. So I kind of personally found it to be more serious a little bit late, but um, yeah, it was a really, it was a real shocker to me when I saw that everybody was out of employment at the same time because everybody was testing positive. Right, because at the time it really felt like it was kind of happening everywhere except at our work. Except with that, yeah, exactly. Right. And it was like, oh, people know about somebody who got sick, but it was never, it just never affected us really. Right. Um, it just took a while for, for it to hit, hit us there. Yeah. Um, do you remember what, what it was like for you during the stay at home orders in 2020? And if you have any stories, could you tell us of a, uh, could you tell us one of them? I didn't really believe it. When I had heard about it, I thought it was just all like, like a legit rumors, like a hoax. Like I just thought people were just making it up until I started seeing it like um, advertised from like the mayors and like city commissioners and like city managers and seeing it all over social media. That's how I found out about those um stay at home mandates or whatever they were called. Um, I think it I think it just kind of affected me like social life wise because I was so used to just really hanging out with my friends when I got out of work. The shift I was working, I was working so late hours. So um, I didn't really get a lot of time to spend time with my friends. So after work, after eight o'clock was when I would be able to spend time with them. And I wasn't able to really do that anymore because of the stay at home mandate. Um, to me personally, I don't see how that was really supposed to prevent anything from happening, but that's just my personal opinion. Um, I, I remember seeing on Facebook, people were like legitimately getting pulled over and getting tickets. And I remember like being scared that like, I was gonna be late to get home because at that time um, I was living in Westlake with my parents. So I wasn't living on the side of town of my, where I work. So I was rushing to get home um, if I had to like put gas or if I was stopped going to get food or if I would try to see my friends for a little bit. So I was, I was really scared at some point that I was going to get pulled over. And it was kind of crazy seeing nobody on the highway or the expressway. Like it was insane. I was like, okay, this is, this is a legit thing. Like we have to legit stay home from this time to this time. So I just thought it was crazy. Right. Cause there was even a time where we have received a letter from the city, uh, kind of getting ready in case oh, people get yeah. um, saying that we were city employees that we were working that, that was going to be the only way right yeah i remember that right i'm pretty sure i still have that somewhere <laughs> we uh, were like keep this in your wallet <laughs> and so you did say that you got a lot of your information for so social media um mm -hmm. did you get maybe any news from like anywhere else or was that maybe not prefer prefer what you prefer to get your news from but just what you were most exposed to um our upper management they were constantly forwarding over us 
um, updated emails from city commissioners. So that was another source other than social media. Um, so I knew if I hadn't heard an update of what was going on with the governor and where, what he was trying to do next with the pandemic, um, our upper management, our deputy directors and our directors were always forwarding us emails from the communications team who was working hand in hand with city management. So that's another way I was always um, being up to date with what was gonna happen next with us in the workplace because of COVID. So a lot of it came from social media and uh, just any updates coming from, from the city, right? Yeah, and my mom. I'm pretty sure everybody's mom. Yeah. Giving us updates as well. Yeah. Uh, could, you, could you share with me uh, what you understand about COVID-19 as an infectious disease and how you feel uh, it's impacted society as a whole? To this day, I have absolutely no full knowledge of what exactly COVID-19 is. I, to, my, to my understanding, it was a virus, um, and it was just a strong virus that mimics symptoms of a cold and a cough and allergies. Um, so that to this day, that is my full understanding of COVID-19. Like, I, I don't really understand it. Um, I know it's greatly affected a lot of people as well as, uh, I mean, my, my own family was affected by it as well. Um, so I know it took a toll to a lot of people, especially the elderly. Um, a lot of the, the death rates were going up significantly since the beginning of COVID and even till now, there's still a significant amount of people around the world that are passing away because of COVID, which is shocking to me even after all these vaccines. Um, but do I fully understand exactly what COVID is? No, I don't. Right, I think the number one thing was just, you know, just don't get it. Yeah, And then much. as far as society goes, I think it did help that we were getting um, constant updates from from the city of McAllen, so it, we would kind of hint to our family that, you know, maybe you shouldn't do this or, you know, right. these things are coming soon. So kind of like get ready for all that. Right. So do you feel your family has the same beliefs as you about COVID-19 or are there some members who take it more seriously or lightly than others? So from my mom's side of the family, I'm, I'm closer to my mom's side of the family than I am to my dad's side of the family. I mean, both my parents and I, we all, the three of us, I'm the only child, so it's just three of us. We all have shared the same viewpoint when it came to COVID and when it came to vaccinations and things like that. Um, I feel like my dad, my dad is very, he's the type of person to be very into um, world news. So he was on top of it since the get-go. My mom was kind of just like, eh, it's really nothing. But then she was like, okay, no, this is something seriously. So my mom's side of the family, I feel like they all took it serious since the beginning. Um, majority of the people on my mom's side of the family are Democrats. So my dad's side of the family, there was a few to this day, they don't think it, it's something that's serious. They don't understand why people are claiming that they're dying because they had COVID um, and they're Republican. So there is a portion of my dad's side of the family that has completely different viewpoints than the rest of us, um, including when it came to vaccinations. Um, so I feel like my family was kind of split in half, but majority of us saw it all as something that we needed to really look into taking care of ourselves and taking care of the entire family and um, doing whatever we needed to do to prevent all of us from getting the virus. And obviously it's very like, just obvious that everybody would have different experiences. And I'm sure that it's mm -hmm. even different from how they reacted to it at the beginning and then how they're right. with it now. Yes. And so you did uh, mention about uh, like getting vaccinated uh, or your family being vaccinated. Um, mm -hmm. Could you, in this next part, I'm just gonna talk about, or I would like to talk about about stories about COVID-19 vaccines 
and any vac okay. vaccination related stories um, that you may wish to, to share. And so the first question is, did you get a vaccine and follow up uh, with the booster shot? Yes, I did. I I was vaccinated. I got to, I chose to get vaccinated a little late. Um, working with the city of McAllen, we were all fortunate enough to be able to get vaccinated through the Hidalgo County Vaccine Clinic, um, which we also had to work. So we worked it, but we had the option of getting vaccinated. We had the option of getting our family members in to get vaccinated as well. So that was something that I did think was pretty cool. And it was, um, it really showed that the city was looking out for all of its employees as well as their family members. But in the beginning, I personally was a little scared and I was kind of worried about getting the vaccine. I did start seeing things on the news where people were still sick or people were passing away or they were having bad reactions to the vaccine. So I was a little timid to get vaccinated in the beginning. My parents got back, well, my dad got vaccinated really quickly, shortly after my mom did. Um, majority of my family was already vaccinated. I think I was the last one in my immediate family to get vaccinated. Um, but I did and I got the, the booster and everything. And so it all worked out. Even when it comes to the workplace or at least uh, that short time uh, when the pandemic hit and you were still at Lark Community Center, mm -hmm. uh, I feel that a lot of people were were just like you, like a little hesitant just because they came out so quick and, you know, people wanted to know what the side effects were going to be. Uh, yeah, and there was like, there was different options. So I didn't know like what was the difference and which one should I get if I choose to even get vaccinated at all. Like there was a point where I was like, I'm never going to get vaccinated. And now I look back and I'm like, what were you thinking? Like you need to get vaccinated. <laughs> Right, because it, it even took me a while. Uh, but like you said, the city did, get, did do a pretty good job on uh, taking care of all of, of all of its employees and yeah. even its family members. Mm -hmm. These next set of questions, Marlene, are going to ask you about how COVID-19 has impacted your life in the way of your family and how it has impacted your personal life. Okay. Uh, you shared with me in our pre-interview that you had a total of four members in your household. Uh, how has COVID-19 impacted your household in terms of the way you interact? Um, I think in the beginning, in inside the household, every I mean, it was fine. Um, it came, I think it was kind of a little bit difficult when it was time to go out of our, our house. So I have two stepdaughters. Um, one is six and the other one is she just turned three so they're so young and the little one it was really difficult to keep the mask on her um but I mean here in the household we weren't like wearing our masks or anything um it was just when it came time to go out to the public there were times where we were like well they're so small we never know what we can bring back into the household so we would refrain from going places but when we would then we we were just really trying our best to help them wearing the mask um, and just trying to like, not trying to have them interact so much with the public basically. But I mean, we interacted with each other fine here inside. And I think now it's just pretty much the same, like pretty simple. Right, cause you could only, you know, like limit your interactions once you go out so much. Uh, yeah, it's I'm, hard. Sure, I'm sure you were leaving with a lot of nice little wipes uh, from the door. Oh, I stocked up on a ton. Like I used to coupon, so I already had a bunch of Lysol. Um, so I had I had a bunch of that Clorox wipes and everything. Like it was ridiculous. I still have a bunch. And I'm sure I got a couple packs. Yeah. From <laughs> um. Is everyone in the household vaccinated? And if not, is there a reason to why they're not? Three out of four. Why is it not four out of four? Because the little one is too small. So um, she can't get vaccinated. Right, that's what, that's what I fear. How has COVID-19 impacted the lives of the two children? Uh, and has it impacted how you and your boyfriend manage your, your all's time? 
it it impacted the girls a lot because of school and because of daycare. Um, so the oldest, her school district, for the longest time, required the mask to be worn. It wasn't maybe until I literally want to say maybe like a month, a month ago, where the school district decided that they were going to lift the mask. So now it's recommended. But for the longest time, I think they were one of the only school districts left in the Valley that was requiring their students and staff to wear the mask. So that affected her a lot. Um, she, but The good thing was is that her, both her parents were very like, adamant to her about you need to wear the mask in school at all times because of the virus. So we would go to the stores and she, she would see other people and she was like, oh my gosh, like, I don't have my mask. Is the virus still there? Like, cause in school I wear the mask. So she was already, she already had it in her, in her mind that she knew she needed to protect herself. So it wasn't really like a struggle for her. Like she, she knew she needed to be cautious about the virus. Um, with the little one with daycare, it, it was hard because the daycare knows that they're so young that they can only wear the mask for such a long period of time. Um, the daycare that the little one goes to, you know, they're really good about trying to enforce like cleanness and making sure the people, like the parents are picking up the children, were wearing their mask and weren't stepping foot inside the facility. So we didn't have to worry about that. Um, so I, I think it, overall, it, like, yes, it did affect them, but it was a doable, a doable thing for them, um, for them both. And you did mention for, for one of them that they, that they just, uh, recently lifted the mask mandate at their school. Uh, oh, yeah. Well, what school district was that? That's with TSJ. Yeah, it was it was pretty crazy. Like I I want to say they were one of the only schools for the longest time um, that they were still advertising that they were requiring the mask. And the only reason why we found out that they were lifting it was because we saw it on the school's Facebook page. Like there was, we didn't get like a notice or something. Um, I'm pretty sure her mom did, but we didn't. But it was on, it was through social media that we found out. And then so after they did lift it, did, you know, did you guys feel scared or were you guys comfortable with still letting her go to school? No, no me personally, I didn't really agree with the long wait period for them to still have the masks on I feel like it should have just I I understand where the school district was was trying to get at um but I feel like it should have just been from required to recommended I don't think it should have stayed required for such a long period of time um there's a lot of kids you know that they're really fully traumatized and it was just very difficult I, I just personally didn't agree with it um I feel like um the oldest, you know, she she was well taken care of. I, I, to me, I feel like it should have been the staff required and the children recommended. Um, there's a lot of other parents that think otherwise, and their their viewpoint is, well, school's already going to be done. You should have just kept it required the rest of the school year. Um, I just personally didn't agree with it. I didn't feel scared because I know she's more than likely still practicing wearing her mask. Um, and knowing the fact that she's vaccinated now, prior to her being vaccinated, it was a little bit more worrisome because we were constantly finding out that there was other kids in the classroom that were getting sick. So that was, was when I was like concerned and I was worried, but now um, I'd, I'm, not, I'm not too concerned about it because she's vaccinated now. Right, I think it was, very concerning for a lot of parents, uh, and yes. especially since at that time, uh, children couldn't get vaccinated. Uh, mm -hmm. I think everyone's a, a little more comfortable now that everyone can get vaccinated. Yes. And so moving over, uh, you mentioned that you mentioned in your pre-interview that your boyfriend also works with the city of McAllen and mm -hmm. is also considered as an essential worker. How did COVID-19 impact his work? and the way he interacts with his team? Um, I feel like it affected him in the same way it affected us because we're all part of 
the same overall department being parks and recreation. It's just he's with parks and I'm with recreation. I feel like it probably affected him more be at some certain point because they have a lot more staff than we do. And so that meant a lot more than we're out. So that meant more, more workload that they had to do within the small groups of guys that they still had left. Um, so there was a lot more projects that were needed to be done. So I think that's where it affected them more. Um, and it affected him a lot more because a lot of his guys were out. Um, he was out for at one point. So I, I think it affected him more than it affected us who were working um, in a facility versus them working in the outdoors, especially because they, they were required to sanitize a lot of their equipment. They weren't allowed to leave certain sites until their equipment was sanitized because of the specific area that they were located at was considered like a high risk COVID area. So that was something else that they had to do um, versus me walking into Palm View and like, oh, I need to sanitize my purse or something. Like we, I didn't have to sanitize anything before walking into a facility, you know what I mean? So I think it affected him a little bit more greatly um, being a part of the department he's part of. Especially like you said that they interact a lot and we, or at least like yourself and a, a lot of us uh, kind of have our own workspaces. So it was right. to take care of yourself and uh, everybody. Yeah, it's yeah. like constant, it's like constant movement and going from park to park and having to deal with people that are out there in the park. So I feel like they were more um, confronted with the public than we were. And even like you mentioned that there was a lot of like sanitizing and a lot of care. Uh, I'm sure that maybe at some point, even the guys were, or the guys in his team or girls, uh, they might have been uh, maybe annoyed with like the amount of work that they had to put into that. And even then, yeah. they still got, some of them still got COVID at the end of the day. Yeah, exactly. So before COVID 19 hit the valley, I know you would visit, visit your and your boyfriend's family consistently. How has it changed the way you interact and visit them? We still we still see both of our families. Um, I think in the beginning, at least for my side of the family, um, I was a little bit more worrisome on visiting my side of the family only because I have an elderly grandmother who was greatly affected by COVID. She got um, she got COVID, so she was really sick at that time. So I really didn't want to go visit her, even when even after she she was fine after um, COVID, like COVID had like completely left her body. Um, I was still kind of timid to go in and visiting her because I didn't want her to get sick again. So it was her and my tia who is handicapped as well. They both live together. Um, so I went from trying to see them as often as I could to kind of staying back and really not wanting to visit them only to protect their own health um, so that it affected me on seeing them uh, with my parents we would still see them even to this day when we would go see them for lunch my parents were still wearing their masks I feel like they chose to still wear their masks for a while even after the mask mandate was lifted um, with my boyfriend's family Everybody in his family is vaccinated except one of his sisters. Um, so they were kind of just joke around like, oh, we're not going to go over because she's here. She's not vaccinated. But um, she took very well care of herself. And we knew that we were all vaccinated. Um, so there wasn't really much of a change. So we would st we still see both sides of the family as frequently as we used to. Um, so I think everything is pretty much like normal. We still do the barbecues. So pretty fine. <laughs> So, oh, like, I do remember that you would mention um, about your grandma um, yeah. and just how, how much you wanted to limit any type of, like, exposure or anything like that. Yeah, and what I, I think what I hate most about, what what I hate most about COVID is a lot of the symptoms mimic allergies, and I have severe allergies. So, anytime I was sneezing or coughing, I was like, oh, my gosh, I could have COVID, and... I didn't want to go over there to see my grandma because I, I didn't want my allergies to end up being COVID. Um, so I would just say talking around the phone and stuff like that, but. Mm -hmm. 
Well, it's good to hear that at the end of the day, um, you know, everything kind of worked out. Um, yeah. So now that we've touched on how COVID has affected your personal life and those around you, um, let's now talk about how this pandemic is affecting the work you do with the city of McAllen as a recreation supervisor and the challenges of running a community center. So how long have you been the Palmview Community Center Recreation Supervisor? So I recently got transferred to Palmview. I think it was in November, maybe. I've been there for a couple of months, probably like six, seven months or so. I think I've been at Palmview, more or less. Um, yeah, I think that's I think that's around about how long I've been at Palmview. Right, because I know it's not been too too long since you've been um, transferred, and I guess overall, yeah. how long have you been working with the city of McAllen? I've been working with the city going on four years this summer. And then I want to say that counts um, how you had started as an instructor, right? Yes, I started as an instructor. I don't even remember. I think it was it was in 2018, but I don't. That's my that's when I started as a rec soup. But I was only an instructor with the city for maybe like three months, three or four months, and then I became a rec soup. So the those going on four years would include when I was an instructor with the city. And then was there a reason for choosing to work with the city or or sticking with the city? Um, there wasn't really a specific reason as to why I chose the city of McAllen. Um, I had just moved back from San Antonio and I just really needed a job. And I was trying to find a job within what I got my degree in. So all I knew, all I knew in college was campus recreation. So I saw parks and recreation and I said, well, it has the word recreation in it. So maybe it's something similar. And that's literally honestly why I chose to apply for the city. Um, why have I stayed with the city? I mean, once you start with the city, you kind of just, I don't think you really leave. So I think that's why I'm still working with the city. <laughs> I hope that's uh, <laughs> good. Yeah. <laughs> It, it, I think I'm still with the city because we offer a lot to the community. And of course, um, I, I appreciate it more now being on the South side at Palmview um, because I grew up from the South side in Donna. So I see a lot of individuals that were similar to the people that were from my hometown. Um, so it's something really, really cool to be a part of. And so you did mention how, uh, you know, the community centers kind of help the community in itself. Uh, could you please share some stories on how work was at Lark Community Center uh, before March 2020? Um, so right before, uh, you know, COVID hit. Right before COVID hit, everything was peachy. I mean, we were still doing all of our programs, all of our special events. Everything was going well. We actually were preparing for Daddy Daughter. So it was a special event for dads and daughters to attend and it was supposed to be 80s theme and we had a bunch of decorations already we had already bought them we had already decorated them um i think georgie had already helped decorating a couple of picture frames and then COVID hit so then we went from all of the team at lark planning this amazing event that lark is known for to being shut down and having to close the doors and having to let go of all the staff basically. Um, so it was really, it was, it was a great time before COVID happened, but then at the time that COVID happened specifically for us, um, I think it was the worst, the worst thing to happen. It, it was really sucky, honestly. Right, because I think it initially just got paused uh, at least like uh, yeah. as far as the event goes and then I think it had been pushed to August and then well at the end of the story is we're barely going to have it again this year so right. from March 2020 it took all the way to April 2022 to be able to be able to run the event again yeah it was really crazy because I feel like as a rec soup 
your job is to just continue to provide these special events to the community around us. So it was like we were in go mode and we were planning summer already and we had all these ideas for all these other programs that we were going to do to then be told, wait, um, we don't know when this is going to happen again. So all your ideas need to be put on pause. So then they were on pause and then it was just, they just never happened. Um, so it was a really crazy time um, for all of us there. Right. And then even like with the phone calls, just people asking uh, what was going to happen and if we had any um, news or updates on COVID. And we oh, yeah. just had to tell people to just basically wait that we would, you know, when we knew something, we would let them know. Yeah, you would you would think that like at that time, people were like, no, keep the doors closed. Like Nobody wants to go back. But everybody was concerned, like the all of North McAllen, because LARP was on the north side, like all of North McAllen wanted to know when was LARP going to allow patrons back into their building. Um, so yeah, the community was just as concerned as we were as staff. So I think overall that kind of sums up how uh, the pandemic impacted your work and even like those first initial, initial experiences uh, with COVID at the workplace. And I remember there was even a long period of time where it was basically, we were just sitting there at the building and they would just have us answer the phone. That was basically it. And everything was closed and we were just sitting in the front, just not doing, not doing much. <laughs> yep. And then as far as like the city of McAllen goes, uh, what kinds of policies did they enact in response to COVID-19? Um, I, I'm trying to remember in the beginning, I, I think I recall, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I recall we were all required to wear masks. So that was one thing. I, I think I remember we were all required to wear masks. Um, and it, it went from, I remember getting an email and from our upper management and it was, even if you're in your office, you needed to wear safety equipment. Like you needed to wear your mask. Um, the manager at the time, he was super anal about cleanness and about um, all of us protecting ourselves. So he went out and bought us these expensive uh, hand sanitizers and the shields with the glasses. So that way we weren't like interacting too close to one another. Um, that part wasn't required with the city, but I do remember at the beginning it was constantly wearing the masks and then it went from you were only required to wear them when within a certain amount of feet from another individual than we were. Then it went from if you're in your office and you're, I think, like six or 10 feet away from somebody, you didn't have to wear your mask. But if you were within the range, less than the range, then you were required to wear the mask. Um, so that was something that the city had enforced all of us city employees to do um, throughout, throughout the whole department or throughout all the parts of the city. I can't really remember anything else um they didn't require us to get vaccinated it was highly recommended but it to this day it, it has yet to be a requirement for the employees to be vaccinated um there was a proper protocol if anybody had any symptoms or showed any whether they said they had symptoms or showed they had symptoms or even if their family members had symptoms or their family members were tested positive for covid um, so the city has always had a certain protocol about how we were supposed to go about handling those, those situations. But of course, those protocols have changed since COVID started up until now. Um, but there was always something put in place for that. Right, because even, I think maybe at the beginning, they did enforce a mass mandate, but I really don't remember. I think the first thing that kind of uh, did they make us do was just take uh, our temperatures and then just oh, go through, yes. through the symptom yes. sheet if you had anything, you know. Yeah, I think there was like a sheet like of questions that we were supposed to be asking our staff members as they came in, um, whether people did it or not, I don't know. But I do, now I do recall the temperatures. Um, we did the temperature checking for a, a while, honestly. I know we still have them there at our center. We don't really use them, but um, that's something we had to practice continuously with everybody coming into work. 
Yeah, I think that was probably one of the things that stuck the longest was just, um, mm-hmm. just taking the temperature. Yeah. Um, and then as far as the community center goes, were, what were some of the biggest challenges when trying to run the center um, during that time? Uh, I think my, my, I think there were two, I guess, biggest challenges. Well, I don't know. There was, there was writing. Um, when I was at LARC, one of the biggest challenges for me was having to tell all of my seasonal instructors that they basically didn't have a job anymore. Um, so that alone, it, 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 it really sucked because I knew that they were all just a bunch of young college kids that just wanted to pay gas. Um, they just wanted to help their mom or dad with one bill payment or something, uh, wanted to buy themselves something nice. So I felt truly, truly horrible having to tell them that they didn't have a job and I couldn't tell them when they were going to get their job back. So that was a really big challenge for management, us as management to have to face. Um, and it, it, what sucked was that we couldn't, we could try to explain to these instructors as much as we could, but some of them just couldn't really understand it. So they were really taking it like personal and it was very hard to explain. And we did lose a couple of staff when, cause the city was playing, <laughs> the city was playing this game <laughs> where we were, okay, no, tell the staff they don't have a job, but they do have a job, just not right now. So then we couldn't tell them when they were going to come back. And then by the time we were told, okay, bring them back. Well, nobody wanted to come back because they had all went and found jobs. They went to Walmart, they went to Whataburger, they went to go work for their parents' business. Um, They found other jobs. So it was very difficult to get told, well, you need to find those staff to come back. Like, well, they didn't want to come back. They had already left. So that was really hard. And then it was, oh, well, wait, they're going to come back. And then surprise, they had to leave again. So it was this like back and forth game with the staff that I just didn't think was right. Um, and, it, and it was all because of COVID. Um, I think another challenge for me was with Palmview. Like I said earlier, it, was, it came down to just me, one of my maintenance techs, and one of my receptionists who was part-time. And we were the only three running the entire facility for almost like a good going on three weeks because all of my staff was out because of COVID. Um, They were out because they either tested positive or they were out because they were waiting for responses. Uh, I think the waiting process that the city had with a specific doctor's office that we're supposed to go to to get tested, um, I think the city met well they mean well with having us go to these certain individuals to get tested. And it's awesome because we don't have to pay, but the waiting process took a very long time because they had so many people that were getting tested for COVID that they weren't finding out the results until almost two weeks. And then it was like, well, oh, your, your test was wrong reading. You have to come back in. So it was, it was a lot of, I could test positive, I could test negative today, but if I interact with somebody tomorrow, that tested positive the other day, I have to go back and get retested and I have to be out for a couple of days. So it was just a ridiculous time. So that was something that was extremely challenging. And then of course I had the staff that didn't want to be at work. So, oh, I'm going to say I have symptoms. So then I was told, okay, well, they say they have symptoms. I need to send them home. So those were all extremely difficult challenges because of COVID that affected me in the workplace significantly right and even with the testing now it's gotten to the point where they're like go get tested and then come back to work and then we'll figure it out afterwards yeah so the, the i feel like their protocols they some at some point they made complete sense but then there were times where they didn't make sense like there was one time where one of the protocols was if your family member tests positive you need to stay home but then if your co-worker tests positive you can come to work and then and then it like switched and it was like reversed so it never really made sense like when to me I was like okay 
if somebody is around somebody tested positive to me, just go get tested. If you're fine, then you come back. Um, but this, the city was always just constantly changing their protocols. Um, so it was kind of getting really confusing for management and for a bunch of staff. I remember in the beginning when COVID first started, I had to pay as a city employee. I, I This is before they had uh, PCI come involved. So I had to go pay out of pocket like $140 to get tested for COVID. And then I think like a week after is when they brought in PCI. And they were like, oh, city, city McAllen employees don't have to pay. And I was like, I literally just went and paid like a hundred and some dollars to get tested. Um, and then there was questions like, well, should seasonal staff have to pay or should part-time staff have to pay? Um, so it was all just really frustrating, the whole testing process, um, the amount of days you had to be out to get the results. And it was, it was just all a mess. It was, it was very frustrating for everybody with the city. Yeah, at some point it was, it seemed organized. And then as, as things added up, it kind of like fell apart little by little. Yeah. And even like you said with the staff, it was a little tricky when, you know, I, I know you kept in touch with them like every once in a while, but to like after a couple of months to be like, okay, like you have to come back to work now. And like you said, some of them had already gotten other jobs and others were already, they were getting stimulus checks. So they were getting. Oh, yeah. Than, than the, the stimulus checks was a huge problem. None of the staff wanted to come back because they were getting that check. And we were getting told, well, you kind of need to tell them to come back. They weren't gonna come back with the checks. Um, so it took a very long time to get staff back into our facility during COVID. And so it sounds like uh, what you talked about were probably like some of the tougher times uh, while trying to make the community center work. Uh, how was your mental well-being when trying to adapt at work because of the pandemic? Um, I feel like on the inside, I was constantly <laughs> breaking down. Um, I think at that time when we were down to just the three of us, uh, I think I legitimately did break down because I had no help. I was. I just remember telling my receptionist, um, her name was Patty. I said, Patty, I need to count on you to help me do all of these things because I'm by myself. And it was hard because I had to ask, you know, my maintenance tech who's only used to working a certain shift. I had to ask, okay, I need your help. Can you do a split shift? Meaning he had to work practically all day um, without getting paid overtime. And then same thing with my receptionist, you know, help me out, like I'll stay in clothes. Um, so there was a lot of times where I had to go and man the front and be there for a few hours until I could wait for her to come back um, while having to turn in all of these tasks to my upper management. Um, and so it was, it was very, very stressing. So I, I did find myself a couple of times um, mentally losing my mind. And I think I broke down maybe like once or twice. Um, at home because I was like, I don't want to go to work tomorrow because it's just kind of impossible to do all the tasks that I needed to get done with the little amount of staff that I had because of what was going on with the pandemic. So uh, it was a lot of, um, a lot of times where I just had to constantly tell myself to take things one thing at a time. Um, I feel like there was times where management was still constantly asking for a lot of stuff from us to get done not understanding that we were so short staffed. So it was very, very stressful um, on me mentally, but at the end of the day, I had a facility that was still needed to be run. Um, so whether it was three staff or one staff or 12 staff, I, I still had an obligation to maintain the facility um, running, basically. Because even, and not even pertaining to COVID, just when somebody calls in or they're out for the day, it's like, okay, now I got to pick up their slack. So I can't imagine mm -hmm. having to pick up everybody's slack just between the three of you guys. Um, so I could, I mean, I can't even imagine like how stressful that could have been. Yeah, it was insane. 
And then so at some point, obviously the city was, um, you know, we reopened uh, permanently. Uh, what were the city's biggest concerns when trying to organize programs and special events? I think this, I think the city's biggest concern, at, at least I, I think I can at least voice to um, management within Parks and Rec, at least what their biggest concerns were, was how to properly word how we were trying to keep the community safe. So marketing is very big on signage. And so we were, the centers were open, our programs were open. So it was about, okay, what's our max capacity now? Max capacity used to be 15 students. Okay, no, now it's six students. Um, what's our minimum? Well, there is no minimum, like, cause our, our max is so low, but do we word it on a sign as masks are recommended or masks are, um, referred or there was like there was like another word another term so it was like required recommended referred um so it was all about the wording to ensure that the public was safe because we had half of the community that didn't care to wear masks and didn't care about mask capacities and then we had the other half of the community that was legitimately not going to register their child unless they knew that every single child in that class was gonna have a mask. Um, there was a lot of people that were coming into our buildings that weren't gonna come in if masks weren't required. And then there were some that were, well, this is America and I don't I don't have to do anything you tell me to do. And if it's required, it shouldn't be required because I have asthma. So I think the city's biggest concern was trying to have every department throughout the city of McAllen be uniform when it came to the proper protocols and procedures about our patrons entering all of our facilities and interacting with all of our programs and events, whether that meant um, being six to 10 feet apart, wearing masks, not wearing masks, having sanitize sanitizer nearby. Um, so I think that's what was their biggest concern, which at the end of the day was also very frustrating still. Um, so yeah, I think that's just ultimately what they really wanted um, all of us to do. Because I also do remember that for at least us that were working the front desk, uh, like you said, there was a certain word that you guys wanted us to use when it came to um, pretty much telling people that they had to wear a mask or, yeah. it, you know, I don't, I don't even remember at this point what the word was, but I, I do remember that there was a certain way you had to phrase it yeah i don't i remember it was like it strongly recommend or encouraged it was it was recommended and encouraged something like so that. those those two words meant like completely different things so it, it went from no we can't have this sign advertising because it says strongly and not just re recommended i don't know it was all about the proper words um, because if we worded it wrong at any point, then the commissioner was going to find out and then everything was going to blow up for the city. And even after taking all those precautions, I think we still found ourselves, maybe not exclusively to us, but at least we would hear, you know, people having issues about getting their temperature taken or wearing the mask. Yep. And so I, I know you're you're big on um, familiar faces. So obviously a lot of families and people use the facility, uh, whether it's for the library, uh, the seniors and the children. Um, and at this point, I think the parents know you pretty well, maybe not at Palmview, maybe they're starting to now. Um, mm -hmm. But were there maybe like any, any events or maybe any stories or things that you saw um, that kind of affected these families uh, during the pandemic? Um, I think maybe recitals could be an example. Um, at our community centers, we do recitals for a lot of our evening programs. There never used to be a limit as to how many family members were allowed to come. And because of COVID, it went from, excuse me, it went from having maybe like four or five family members to where you were only allowed to bring two family members. 
So I think that's something that affected the families that were enrolling their children in some of our programs. Um, so I think that's probably a good example. I'm trying to think of maybe another way that families could have been like, personally affected by it. Um, I mean, the, the, the amount of students that were allowed in classes, that of course was a thing. Um, there was a lot of families that didn't want the class to be so small. They wanted it to be bigger because they had, oh, well, my son's best friend, he didn't get to register and I wanted to be in the class with him. But it was something that we needed to stand by. So that was another issue that, another, well, another thing that families were affected by. Um, a lot At one point, a lot of our classes were offered virtual or when we weren't offering classes, things were virtual. So then it became a point to where, well, I don't have social media, so I can't get access to seeing a virtual class. That's why I want to come in the center. So families were affected in a variety of ways um, with our programs and events. Even like you said, when it came to to the max registration <laughs> of students, there were even some parents who, who would ask, oh, how many students are there? And if they thought it was too many, then they just wouldn't. Mm -hmm. It just wouldn't um, do the registration for, for the right. Kids. And so after all this, was funding for, for the community center ever in jeopardy during the pandemic or was funding mostly consistent and not an issue? Um, I feel like funding was always an issue. Uh, funding's always been an issue with our facilities even prior to COVID. We only have a certain budget to do a lot of our programs and events. I think it was greatly affected even more our budget because we had to constantly think outside of the box. We had to constantly be thinking, okay, COVID happened. We still need to provide this utmost customer service to our patrons but with half of our budget cut. So because of COVID, uh, we weren't offering a lot of events in public, so our budgets were cut. So it was very hard to plan all these new events and programs, making them somewhat virtual with the little amount of money that we had, um, especially since we had no staff. So we didn't have funding to so we weren't having programs with participants, we weren't getting funds, meaning we had no funds to pay our staff. So at the end of the day, it came down to, well, our full-timers that are on salary, they're continuing to get paid. So let's have them do the classes. So it came down to us management having to do a couple of videos for virtual programs um, because we just didn't have, we really didn't have money to spend Money wasn't coming in, so we had nothing to really buy. Right, it just kind of seemed like a never-ending cycle, mm -hmm. and it, it it was it was difficult. Um, and especially like you said, there was no money to get the staff because I remember at some point you would let let's say you would ask for for the staff members to come in, and then you would look at the numbers and you had to ask two or maybe even three of them you know, that they had to go home because there just wasn't enough students to to pretty much keep them there. Yeah, exactly. And so were, were there or are there any things the city of McAllen is planning in order to inform the community that programs are up and running again? Oh yeah, they're all over social media. Um, Facebook is the biggest platform that our marketing team is currently using to get the public to be fully made aware of the fact that all of our programs and events are back up and running. I think majority of the public is aware of that. And I think a lot of the returning customers that we have do know that our programs are back. There's a few people that still think we don't offer anything, but majority of the people are fully made aware of that the city of McAllen is back up and running. Um, this would be, I guess, not our first summer back because this past summer, it will, we still had a variety of programs, but we highly anticipate for this summer to have 
back to regular numbers. So we anticipate a lot more participation than last summer, um, just because a lot of the mandates have already been lifted. And yes, COVID is still around, but to the people around our surrounding areas, they're just fully ready to come back. So, um, yeah. Right, all that was a little tricky, um, you know, especially with the numbers and, and all that. Um, and that kind of wraps it up with the work-related challenges um, as you as a recreation supervisor. Um, this last section asks you to share any stories or if you have, uh, or that you have about this pandemic and the response by local, state, and national elected officials, feel free to respond or pass on any questions. Do you feel satisfied with the local response to COVID-19 in Edinburgh slash McAllen and Hidalgo County over these last two years? Um, I feel like, yes. I feel like all, all everybody was just really following the orders of um, the governor and the government. I think a lot of people were like, why doesn't the city do this sooner? Or why can't the city do this? Or this other city is doing that. But what people didn't really understand was city officials can only do so much. Yes, they have a higher authority within the city that they work for. However, if the governor chose to go one route and was saying it was a requirement for all these other cities to follow, then that's just how it had to be played out. Um, but overall, I think those, all of the cities within the Rio Grande Valley um, were able to properly execute what needed to be done about the pandemic. And even then, like you said, that a lot of people might've felt that um, the vaccinations took maybe a little longer than they would have uh, preferred to come into the county mm -hmm. or into the cities. But even then it felt almost when we did offer them, a lot of people weren't taking advantage of it. Uh, yeah. Cause some people were just opting to not, to not get vaccinated. Mm -hmm. Are you satisfied with the state response to COVID-19 led by Governor Abbott over these last couple of years? I wouldn't say like all the way. Um, I, I mean, a perfect example is if you go back and see and, and recall, there was a lot of schools in the state of Texas that were sending um, letters to the governor that were saying, basically, what are you doing and why do you want the mask mandate to be lifted tomorrow? Like. I feel like he was trying to act too fast on the situation and not fully trying to understand what was going on with the pandemic, which was crazy because you would think somebody with such high, high power would take the time to actually sit and consider all of the students that were in school. Um, and he really wasn't. So I think him acting on trying to get these masks lifted immediately was the utmost worst decision he could ever possibly make. Uh, I think he saw a negative feedback from a lot of people and a lot of school districts were acting quickly on it. I do know there was a variety of schools in the Valley themselves that were petitioning for what he was doing um, and kudos to all of them because every, they all had the right to do that. So I think the way he was acting about the pandemic and the mask um, was ridiculous, and I did not agree with it or support it at all. Right, because it almost felt like he was taking a priority over, like, money that was coming. Oh, yeah. And it just felt like the people were kind of just, like, left behind. Um, right. And even with the schools, I think there, I, I think so, I might be wrong, but I think there was a time where even some of the schools were kind of just saying, you know what, like, we're just going to go ahead and enforce a mask mandate even, mm -hmm. even yeah the school yeah. the school districts were willing to get fined and they were willing to get all these whatever consequences that were going to come at them they didn't care they literally were like to hell with what the governor is saying we're going to protect our staff and our students a hundred percent 
Um, so yeah, I, I remember seeing that a little bit. And so moving on from the governor onto the president, uh, how do you feel about the national response to COVID-19 led by President Trump in the year 2020 and then President Biden um, from 2021 to present? Um, Same well, thing. I'm a Democrat, um, so I did not um, vote for President Trump. I do not support anything that President Trump has to say. I think not only his actions with the pandemic were ridiculous, I think his actions with everything he had ever did as a president in office was ridiculous. Um, I think he saw COVID-19 as a hope. I think he thought it was like an alien ship was coming down. And I think President Trump thought somebody saying I have COVID was like somebody saying I saw an alien in my backyard. That's how I feel President Trump took the seriousness of the pandemic. Um, he literally was on the news saying that the pandemic didn't exist, that people were lying and people just wanted money, which made no sense whatsoever. So I think he did nothing to better this country when it came to the pandemic. And I think President Biden came in at a perfect time and picked up a lot of mess that President Trump made. Um, perfect example, there's a lot of people in this world that are not vaccinated because they're Republicans and because President Trump told them not to get vaccinated. What kind of person would want a variety of people throughout the whole United States to not get vaccinated because they're saying so, because they're saying nothing's wrong with the world. And guess what? All those people that voted for Trump that chose not to get vaccinated, they all got sick. So it made no sense and half of them probably did. So yeah, no, those are my thoughts on how President Trump handled the whole pandemic. Um, I know I may have not personally taken it seriously in the beginning, but there was no way I would ever think the way Donald Trump did. Um, so yeah, those are my thoughts. So after those comments, if you had the power of a political office to respond to COVID-19, what would you have done differently? That's a hard one. Um, I think you really need to put your, you need to put yourself in the shoes of everybody that's around you, regardless of their political beliefs. And I think that's what Donald Trump did wrong. I think he was just trying, trying to voice his thoughts based only on those that were Republicans. I think he was trying to give the public who was Republican what they wanted to hear. I don't think he was considering the lower income families. I don't think he was considering the middle class people. Um, he wasn't considering anybody that was of color. And so he didn't take any, any of that into consideration. So I think as somebody in a political standpoint, you need to consider all of those individuals when it comes to handling situations like COVID-19. Um, not, not making decisions based off of, oh, I'm gonna do this because they're, I think everybody's Republican, everyone's Democrat, and they're gonna listen to me if I do this. Um, so I think you need to consider everybody's situation. Right, because they're basically there to be for us, for like all the people, but it mm -hmm. was like he was just taking care of his own little his own little crew and just turn like exactly. a blind eye to blind eye to to the rest of of the nation and so now that we kind of touched on on the governor and the presidents uh this is a special year in our national democracy because it's a midterm election um do you plan to vote and if so is the issue of COVID 19 going to factor into your votes can you say it again so it's going to be a uh, a midterm election voting this year uh, and I'm, I'm sure you're, you're planning on voting, but yes. it's the issue of COVID-19, 
you know, is that going to be play a factor into who you end up voting for? Oh yeah, most definitely. Um, only because I I saw what President Trump was saying and doing um, when he was president, and then comparing it. Sorry, my laptop is about to die. Let me just plug it in before it dies. Is that one percent? <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, but yeah, no. So basing his views, or for example. Um, when he was running for office, I didn't like anything he was saying, so I didn't vote for him. So if somebody is running for president and is basically disagreeing with a lot of the things that President Biden has done because of the pandemic, I won't vote for that person because it's not going to match my political views and it to me doesn't make sense. Um, as a president coming into office, you should want to have good plans in place to prevent COVID-19 from striking the United States like it did to everybody around us. Um, so I will definitely be considering COVID-19 as a main topic and a main reason um, as to who I would vote for for the upcoming election. Right, and hopefully um, somebody that will listen, listen to the experts uh, this time because that was a bit of a mess. Yep. Um, and so is there any sort of help or aid you could have used at the peak of the COVID-19 pandemic to make your life more manageable or less stressful? Um, I don't think so. I, I, think, I think mainly just because the city took care of us. Yeah, the, the city, as crazy as it was, they really did ensure that there was always going to be a proper protocol um, to handle any anything that was going on with us. If we felt sick, if we were tested positive with COVID, um, the city really was there to assist us along the way. And they provided us with a variety of resources to help us get the help that we needed. Um, so I think, it, I think the city, surprisingly, did a really good job with all of that. Right, because even how, uh, you know, earlier you had mentioned that at times it was kind of a mess. Um, the resources were always there. Um, and at the, at the end of the day, whether you you were able to get it, you know, a day from when you asked to a week, you were, you were always going to get it for sure, without a doubt. Right. So what impact or purpose do you hope your story may have on listeners of the voices of a pandemic digital archives? Mm. It's a tough one. I mean, I hope they find the answers that they're looking for. Um, <laughs> everybody that's being interviewed has different stories. We all have different backgrounds. Um, they may have liked President Trump, they may have not been vaccinated. So I think, um, oh, I would hope that they get whatever data it is that they need and kind of put together um, some good research to whatever it is that they need to get. Right, maybe they can um, go to some Palm View Community Center events coming in the future. Oh, I know. You can sign up on mccallumparks.net. <laughs> Okay, now this is our very last question. Is there anything else you would like to share with me about your experiences with COVID-19 that I have not asked about? Um, there, I guess maybe the only thing I could maybe share, um, there was a tricky time at work where I was, what was the phrase? Um, I came in contact with an individual that was positive and they were from my household. So I needed to leave work immediately and go get tested. So I did. And I had just recently gotten tested two days prior because I was in contact with somebody at work. Um, I hadn't gotten those results, but because I had still been in contact with somebody from the household, I still had to go retest. 
So I went to get tested and then I had to be out of work for X amount of days until I received my results. Then I got my results and I got told I tested positive for COVID-19. And then a couple of days late, I think like two days later, I get a late phone call from risk management. Was it risk management? Yes, I think it was risk management saying that my results weren't weren't accurate and that I wasn't positive. So I was out for X amount of days, but then I get, I mean, it was very frustrating because I was out from work and to get told I was positive and then to still, I was out for work waiting to get my results. Then I was out because I was told I was positive all while a specific event was going on. That was a very important event with the city. It was our McAllen Marathon. So then, to then I get told, oh no, you didn't have COVID, but you still can't return to work actually um, because we just wanna make sure you're fine. So it was, to me, it was, it was very even more stressing because I later found out that I wasn't just the only city employee that was given false readings. Um, but what got me more upset was there, to me, if I'm on salary, I'm fortunate enough to where I'm still getting paid. But there was a lot of part-time staff that were getting false readings and they were out of work and they were technically supposed to get paid because they got they were positive and they were with city employee. But then they found out that the readings were false, so they weren't gonna get paid. And that but fell on the doctor's office that the city was sending us to. But it was a thing to where it was like, oh, well, there's just so many people that are getting tested. So then that was like a huge, another huge eye opener because you're like, wait a minute, these people are getting about 200 City of McAllen employees a day getting tested. But hearing the fact that some of us were getting false readings and it was affecting us, whether it was getting paid, whether it was our, our job duties at work, having to find sitters for the kids because we had to be, like we had to have them here with us and we had to be out. Um, I, I think it was um, a very unprofessional thing to encounter that, ha that happened. I think it was very unprofessional and it wasn't just me that was affected by it. It was a lot of other staff. Um, and I think what upset me the most was hearing that a lot of staff weren't able to get paid um, because of that. So that's something else that happened to me uh, being affected by COVID. So to this day, I don't know if I had COVID, if I didn't have COVID. Um, I had to file a whole report about once you test positive for COVID. Um, I had to do, what was it, um, workers comp? I had to do a whole workers comp package and then I got told that I didn't qualify for workers comp. Um, so then it was like, well, as a salary person, they put me to get paid through workers comp. But then it was like, well, if I got denied workers comp, am I gonna, are they gonna take that out of my next salary paycheck? But uh, it shouldn't have been that way because I wasn't at fault for being out I was out because I was told I had tested positive. So it was a very frustrating thing uh, that I wish upon nobody. Um, but that's something else that that did happen. And I'm not too sure, but I think I was the person you had been exposed to. Because I, I think, no. was it not me? No, it, it was, it was my main text. And as he was, so no, yes, it was my main tech because of his daughter or because he was the wrong, I don't know, it was one of my texts. Or I, I actually, I think, I think you had gotten tested because you had been exposed to me, but I think that time there was yes. an issue. Right. Because I also remember that even our manager at the time, and that was, that's kind of where some of those like city rules just didn't really make sense because you were sent yeah. to get tested, but our manager, even though I was um, interacting with him, he was told to not get tested and 
you know, basically you have to keep working mm -hmm. and even like it affected you um i think there was also a time that it affected mario mario um your boyfriend yeah um and there was even a time where you guys couldn't have the girls at the house with you guys correct and so that pretty much sums it up um for for the interview um so thank you marlene uh, thank you for sharing and thank you for your time uh You're welcome. Sure your stories will help the voices of a pandemic horror history project perfect